Welcome to the Coriolis Effect with Corey Oliver. Hi guys, I'm Corey Oliver. Thanks for watching the Coriolis Effect. Please hit the subscribe button below and we hope you like this episode. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Corey. How are you? I am actually really, really well. Are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Good. I'm going to make you feel a lot better. Oh. I have a surprise for you. You do? I do. What is it? We after three and a half months, have hit one million <gasps> views. Are you kidding? Ah! I cry. You happy? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Well, thank the people. <laughs> Sorry. I am, you know, this was just a con, not even a concept three months ago. That's right. And um, it's not necessarily the number of one million, although that's amazing. Um, it's the people that it's reached and the support that we've had. Uh, I feel really grateful. I, I can't believe we couldn't have done it with all, all of our guests and uh, your obvious hard work. And it's been a lot of time um, that's been invested into this. So I'm really grateful. Yes. And I mean. amazed. It took a lot to get here, and let's keep going. Yeah, so thank you to everyone who has participated um, in coming on the show, taking the time, whether it's a Zoom or um, coming down to the studio. Uh, we appreciate you and value you, and uh, I thank you to all of the listeners and, and um, followers. We are grateful for you, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That's a great surprise. You're down there, over there, bobbing around. Like, I know. that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. That is really cool. Hi, guys. We wanted to announce that, like many podcasters, we just started a Patreon account. Visit our page at patreon.com backslash the Coriolis effect. We have five different levels of membership and offer early access to episodes, behind the scenes footage, bonus episodes, shout outs, and much more, including personal phone calls, questions and answer sessions, and live chats with Bob and me. That's patreon.com backslash the Coriolis effect. This episode is sponsored by Military True Crime Addict, which can be found on any podcast platform as well as at militarytruecrimeaddict.com. If you are searching for a podcast about crime relating to actual life events of military personnel, veterans, family members, and those associated with the military in any way, then you've come to the right place. Military True Crime Addict explores a plethora of actual true crime stories that have not been reported by news outlets or media. Stories that, upon hearing, will astound you. Historical events that should have been told and reported upon long ago. There are detailed stories that touch on topics such as assault and battery, harassment, abuse of power, murder, hazing, sexual assault, and other stories that in some way relate to our military, veterans, and their extended families. Military True Crime Addict provides a voice for the victims and tells their side of the story. It will raise awareness of heinous crimes and those most impacted by those crimes. You do not need to know anything about the military to enjoy this podcast. You can hear original true crime stories with the specifics of what occurred. That's military true crime stories. Hi, Bob. Just hi, no good morning. Oh, good morning, Bob. Good morning, Corey. How are you? I'm doing actually really well. How are you? I am also very well, except getting old. I was actually going to just say, not that. that I'm getting old? No, I was going to say you look great. You have like a, you look like you've lost weight and you have a goatee. You know, I love facial hair. Um, and you, you don't, you look younger. I have a, this is a great comedian. I can't think of his name right now. This is a, I have a great new diet. I eat whatever I want. I do whatever I want. I don't exercise. I just tell people I used to weigh 400 pounds. <laughs> I go, oh, you look great. <laughs> um, I'm getting older in my head. So. I don't buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, but I, you know, every once in a while, it's like two or three packages that a week show great. up. And now they're like, it's coming like two days later, some even the next day. So like Christmas, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's a, no, that's Wish, by the way. You order something on Wish, and it takes like 30 days to get there, so that by the time you get it, you have no idea what it, it is. is. It's Christmas. like Christmas, yeah. <laughs> so I bought three things, and I got two of them, and then one came the other day in this box unmarked. So I open up the Amazon box and in it is a box about, you know, 12 inches by nine inches by two inches thick, white with no labeling on it. And I, I can't remember what it was. I said, okay, I'm not going to open it until I remember what it is. And I just ordered it two days ago. 
and I stared at it for 10 minutes and I could not remember what it was. I had to open it. <laughs> and it what was, was it? It was this. Oh, it was a gift. Oh! Clapperboard. No! <laughs> Let me see that. You got this? Yeah. For me? No. Well, sort of. I Show know. Me. I know. It's not for... Oh, ow. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. Ah. Uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Action. I bet that's your nightmare. Oh, great, it's like Thank a toy you. now. <laughs> it's like that toy that the parents get. Oh, that yeah, someone yeah. gets your kid and you're like, wait, why'd you give me that toy? Um, we, um, I had a friend of mine, Steve. And this is great. He had a baby about a year before I had a baby. This and, is great. and so we started going back for the that's gifts. Right. And he was in Philadelphia. You're so official. Thank you. Sorry. So he, he sent me something. I sent him something. And I, I must have sent him something that made noise. And this is a fraternity brother of mine. He said, oh, yeah? Okay, you want to play those games? So he sent me back something, like a rattle or something that Jonathan was wanting, just going nuts or whatever. And we went back and forth for about two or three years. Every kid's birthday and Christmas, we'd send him something. Intentionally, it would make noise. And then I got fed up, and his kid was five or six, and I sent him a drum set. Oh, like that's those, cruel. Before, he called me up, because this was before texting. He called me up and says, I give up. You in. We're done. <laughs> said, he said his son had not stopped playing, I, I want to say 48 straight yeah. hours without like sleeping oh. or anything. He was just on the, and I said, get him less because he doesn't want less. He just wants to hit the drums in random order <laughs> all throughout the night. Oh, like, you're right. such a good friend. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good one. Oh my so, gosh. The other story I wanted to tell you is, I tell you, my mother, sister, aunt, and I, and nephews all have this video conference once a week on Sundays. And so we talk, and it's like an hour, hour and a half. And a lot of times I'm, you know, working on other stuff because Every time I try to talk, they talk over me. But I learned something about my grandmother that I had never known before. My, my grandmother, Mary, had a sister, um, Marge. She was the one that pinch her cheek, Aunt Marge. Oh, cute. And they, Marge, like, never got married. Never. I don't think she ever went on a date. She lived until she was, like, 80. Um, That's why. And live, yeah, and lived with my grandmother and grandfather for a while. And I don't think my mother liked Marge too much over the years. Oh. But the story was Marge had passed first. So when my mother was with my grandmother picking out the dress for Marge to be buried in, grandma said, no, no. Uh, my mom said, oh, she likes pink. Let's put in this beautiful pink dress. And grandma said, no, 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 uh, put her in this blue one. And he goes, why? She says, just put her in a blue one. And I find this story. He said, why the blue one? She goes, I was trying to get rid of the dress. <laughs> so then. Okay, that's a lot right there. My grandmother comes out to Los Angeles with my Aunt Jeanette. And my grandmother says, this is years and years ago says, I want to go down to the, to the uh, fashion mart and I want to buy a dress to be buried in. So Jen's like, all right. So they go down there. They're there for five or six hours picking out dresses. And they're down in these places. Um, now, if you go down to LA in the fashion mart, there's got to be 50 yeah. stores with oh, like yeah. quinceanera dresses and all these kind of dresses. So the nice little Hispanic uh, helper, she's about 19 or 20, says, oh, this is beautiful. Is this for a wedding or quinceanera? And Jen goes, no, she's looking for the dress to be buried in. The girl's like, oh, deal spills and runs to the back of the store and <laughs> doesn't want to wait on him anymore. <laughs> I don't blame her. I would have done the same thing. Well, what I told my mom is you shouldn't have buried her in that dress. You should have just made her mad. Gosh. Um, I am totally segueing over to a Newsmax post that I got today okay. um, on the way in. Wait, a lot of happens to me. No, I don't want to think of that. Well, I always tell no, people, I don't want to think about it you bury me in a nice suit, but keep a pair of shorts and a fan because I'm not sure which way I'm going. Oh, don't say that. You don't say that. You're going to go right to heaven. I hope so. Um, I'm trying to look for this. Um, here it is. Uh, so a lot, like I said, happens right. to me on the way in. Things just get to me, and that's probably because God knows I don't have a long attention span. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I better tell her right before she goes on. Yeah. I was um, thinking of squirrel. Exactly. Squirrel. Shiny object. Um, but I got this from Newsmax, and it says... If you have over 50000 in savings, be aware Biden and the Fed just announced massive changes. And so, you know, I get that. And I think immediately, like, again, anytime you say if any news corporation or media outlet says be aware, that's a negative connotation. Right. It's not basically saying, oh, you're going to get 15% on your savings, right? What does that suggest to you? Okay, it suggests that they're going to institute a wealth tax, but here's the problem. The power to tax by the federal government comes from the Constitution, okay? 
all, in fact, all the powers that the government has comes from the Constitution. And there's a clause called the enumerated clause or enumeration clause that says the government can only do what it's permitted to do in the, con in the Constitution. It's not like the government can do anything except what we tell you not. It's no, they can only do what we allow them to do. Now, they also. Well, that's expanded. not true. Yeah, no, Because we've got Emergency Authorization Act. Yes, we've but got... if. Well, that's under the Health Act. I but understand. If it ever came to a, 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 um, a trial and stuff, the Supreme Court would strike half of it down. That's why all of these fines, these. Ten thousand dollar fines—they're against the Sixth Amendment. They're they're abusive. Anyway, but what? I, but but isn't yeah. hasn't that fifty thousand already been taxed? Now they want to tax it again. That's the point. The government only has the ability to tax your income. They don't have the ability to tax your assets. Now, if you put money in the bank and earn interest, they can tax the interest. So if I have a hundred thousand dollars bank and I make three thousand dollars a year on an interest. They can tax that $3,000. Except for they your house taxes, because that's, that's an asset. That's, that's totally different. First of all, that's not the federal government. That's the state, actually not even the state government, it's the county. And that's how they pay for schools and it's property taxes. The, and the lottery. And the lottery. <clears throat> so the government doesn't have the ability to tax your assets. So if they make a law, they have to do one of two things. One, they have to pass a Supreme Court challenge, which I don't think it will, or they have to amend the Constitution. But what does, like, you know, you're sitting there, you're looking, you're thinking, okay, maybe you have 50000 in savings, I don't know. And and you see this text come in. If you have over 50000 in savings, be aware, Biden and the Fed just announced massive changes. Well, I want to go look that up because Let's look what it, it up sounds and find like, out. okay, we'll look it up for, for the next uh, segment, but it sounds like they're going to tax that money. Because remember, Warren was big on a wealth tax. You can't tax something that's already been taxed. Sure you can. But let's like arbitrarily, like, okay, well, you've saved up all this money, and we're going to tax you on the money that you've saved? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you make a person makes $100,000 a year, and you pay your 30% for um, state tax, and then you're in, our, I'm sorry, they're federal tax, and then in California, you're 13.5% state tax. So now you're at 43% taxed away. Now you have $56,500 left over. Every time you go to buy something, that same money is taxed again. Aren't people starting to like wake up? We've got Israel bombing now each other. We have high gas prices. We have no gas in some of the states. Yeah, I'm just like, what? This is not your, your this is not great, we, people. I think I mean, we talked about this before. The Boston Tea Party, when they, they were repelling against taxation without representation. Do you know what the amount of the tax was? 2%. 2%, yes. 2%. Yes. We fought a yes. war over a 2% 2 tax. 2% tax. Yeah. I know. Warren Imagine was, that. Warren said she wanted to tax like 1% or 2% of anybody's whose net worth was over $50 million. And which, here's my problem with that. You say, I, I'm never going to get there. Okay, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's not that. It's they start at the $50 million. Okay. And then five years later, all right, we're going down to 25 And pretty soon, it'll be down to a million, which... It's not that hard to get. No. With money. You and, own a house, you're at a million dollars. And they just raised the capital gains to 40%. was 20, now it's 40. Did they raise it? Yes. To 40. When does it start, though? I'm pretty sure it's implemented. No, they can't. They, they, it can this only, next year. It would be will so be, for 2021. Right. right. Well, that's going to be a problem. I would paying. think so. I would think so. Yeah. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. And I'm just trying to gather information to find out exactly what you meant by be aware that's concerning in and of itself. And then you have, you know, the fact that there are massive changes. Well, the Aren't other we... question is what does savings mean? Is it, if I have money in stock market, right. is that savings? Right. Or, yeah. Well, and also I feel like, and I could be labeled a conspiracy theorist right now, but in my gut, I feel like the best way to attack <laughs> a society is to weaken them, which yes. we all are in this weakened state, right? Yes. Economically, spiritually, physically. And now we're just going to hammer us with like, the, you know, everything we can. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, not Somebody of, please tell me, help me understand. I, I'm actually reaching out to the public. If you have any insight on um, what this means, what that text means. Not a lot of people realize this, but, and I can't remember the guy who said it, but uh, somebody in the United, uh, Soviet Union said years and years and years ago, your grandchildren and grandchildren's grandchildren will be communist. We will take over and we will not even fire a shot. And he was talking about first we start mm. with the schools and then we wow. start with that. And that's happening here. Mm -hmm. Once all the schools agree to start an ideology, that's where the country goes in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Because that's what they teach the kids. And the kids, these kids today, they don't, it's not that they don't know any better. They're not taught any better. They're not taught about World War II. Mm -hmm. They're not taught about what socialism and communism and fascism did to the world. Mm -hmm. 
And if you say 100 million people died 80 years ago, well, what do I care? Wait to see what happens. And they, they don't even look at um, uh, Venezuela and see that w what where it goes wrong and mm -hmm. say, look, we've tried this in the last 20 years. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Well, no, they're trying to flee that country. Yes, everybody's leaving that country. Okay, who's, well, uh, who's coming today, in today? today we have um, Pedro Brenner and Guillermo. Guillermo. Guillermo, sorry. Um, Guillermo Ivan. Um, the director and the actor from the movie uh, Lady of Guadalupe. Oh, okay. And I watched the trailer and it was compelling. I actually texted you. I'm like, I'm sobbing. Because it really looks like a great story. And it's based on a true event. Right. So I'm really excited to talk to them and what inspired them and how, why, how they kind of, you know, pulled this whole thing together. You know, it's very, it's an act of God to get a movie made in this industry. Yeah, no kidding. Like li yeah. <laughs> literally people think, oh, you know, it's, it all comes together. It doesn't. And you've got to get the financing. And to get the financing, you have to have the talent. But to get the talent, you have to have the financing. And it starts there. And then it goes from there. So let's talk. Okay. I think we're, we're ready. We're ready. We'll, we'll see you in two uh, minutes. OK. I also want to thank BeverlyHillsBalm.com, which is my partner in my business, um, for supporting our show. It is BeverlyHillsBalm.com. And it's a jumbo lip balm, which is fantastic. This is the original. It's very, very smooth and yummy. It has five ingredients in it. That's it, five. It smells so good, it's peppermint. And you can put this on your cheeks, your lips, you can use it on your hands, you can use it on your elbows, you can put it on your split ends. I've had so many people write in with a lot of different um, usages for this balm. It's kind of an all-inclusive balm, although we kind of use, uh, we use it for our lips and cheeks as well, because we do have a pink. So I do have it on. I just put it on my cheeks and my lips. This actually is a great little trick if you are married and you are, um, you just washed your face and you want to go to, bed, to go to bed and look kind of fresh and fun, you can leave this on your skin all night long. Just put on your cheeks, it gives you a little color, and put on your lips, it gives you a little color. This is our um, pink shimmer. Has a little bit of mica in it, so it's kind of shiny and shimmery, but this is BeverlyHillsBalm.com. Uh, we thank you also for supporting our show. All right, and uh, let's start the show. Thank you so much. Um, today, we have two very special people in, in, well, I don't even know if you guys are actually in Hollywood. Do we even say that anymore in Hollywood? It's, nobody films in Hollywood anymore. I know, but this movie, I'm telling you guys, if you have not seen it, uh, you've got to see it. Uh, we have Pedro Brenner, the director of this movie that I'm going about to say. I'm gonna hold, sit it for the seat of your pants, Bob. And Guillermo Ivan, the actor. I booked um, the show. I know what the movie's called. I know. It's called Lady of Guadalupe. And I'm going to tell both of you. Thank you. <laughs> I watched the trailer this morning, and I literally text Bob because it's that impactful. At the end of this trailer, I'm not. I'm so sorry. I don't know the girl's name, but she literally looks in the camera and says, um, have a little faith. And there's, <laughs> right? And all it takes, right, is the faith of a mustard seed. Yeah. And so that's probably what you had when you started this journey with Lady of Guadalupe. Um, I was just talking to Bob of how difficult it is to get a movie made in Hollywood. It's literally an act of God in and of itself when all of the pieces come together, right? But I would love to know. I have many questions for both of you. Um, first, I'll start with uh, first. Hello. Oh, sorry. We have a uh, we have a, a word of the day. Oh. Bob is not on camera, by the way. He's off camera. Bob's so not allowed to be on camera. No. Um, okay, so we have a, every episode we do a phobia and we say to the guests and see if the guests can guess what the phobia is. So I'm going to announce, as soon as I get this set, I'm going to announce the phobia and you tell me what it is. Theophobia. Theophobia. T-H-E-O phobia. Theophobia. It's the fear of. Um. I'm clueless on this one. So you say theophobia? Yes, theophobia. But, well, is it the, the, the fear of religion or theology or something like yes. that? Yes, religion ah, or God. Fear of fear religion, yes. You I was going to say the fear theology, of theater. Right? Yeah, theology, that's right, yeah. I got to tell you, I mean, that, that wasn't that, that hard one, but 34 episodes, 35 episodes, and you're the first third person to get it right. 
Well done, guys. That's why you need a director from time to time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right. Um, speaking of, Pedro Brenner, you are the director of Lady of Guadalupe. And yep. tell me just what your process was and how this story came to you and what motivated you. It's based on true events, right? Yeah. Uh, look, the story of Lady of Guadalupe in my personal journey started a long time ago you know, when, I was, uh, when I was a little kid, and I mean a really little kid. Um, uh, uh, my aunt took me to see John Paul II, the Pope. And I mean, the, the, the crowd was so big that we knew we'd just see him pass by. So we were standing by a, an outpost uh, from, um, I guess it was a Red Cross outpost or something like that, in case people will need some kind of uh, emergency or something like that. And suddenly the Pope stopped for a sip of water or something. And he got off the Pope mobile and, uh, and carried me in his arms, just blessed me and put me down. I mean, at this point, obviously, that didn't have that impact in my life. Later, when I um, <clears throat> will go to the Basilica and you will see the statue of John Paul II outside the Basilica, it, it suddenly starts, like, connecting the dots. And um, uh, when I started writing this uh, story, um, I realized that there was a need for relief and hope, you know, and, uh, and that the people who needed the most were not getting it because... Um, there was a moment that getting to the Basilica, which is where the Lady Guadalupe is, um, was getting to be difficult because of insecurity. <clears throat> so I thought, well, you know, if, uh, if the mountain, uh, uh, if people can come to the mountain, maybe we can take a little piece of the mountain to them. And that's really where it started. And later I started writing with my co-writer, Sean Dockery, and we, we wrote uh, what it's now the movie Lady Guadalupe. You know, but it, it, the journey to me, like I said, um, my parents are foreigners. I was born in Mexico. And learning and living in the, in the Latin culture was also kind of like what prepared me to write Lady Guadalupe. Because I, I got to see and experience the culture in um, kind of like an outsider way. You know? And um, so it, it, it's, it's a complicated uh, journey, but it, it's difficult for somebody to write or to play the car, like the main car, like Guillermo did in this movie. If you are not born in Mexico, if you were born in Mexico, you understand certain things of the culture that are like pretty much magical, surrealistic. Otherwise, you really you couldn't uh, put together the story. So, the Lady of Guadalupe is obviously the story of Juan Diego, Juan Santli, the first uh, um, Native American saint in history, and his encounters with Lady of Guadalupe. But it's it's uh, paired with a modern miracle. That happens, you know, in, in LA today. So um, that was part of the the complication was to find an actor that had the capacity to play two characters with a five hundred year span of distance, which is it's it's not easy because you're not playing the same character. You're playing two reincarnations of different humans in different time lapses. And obviously, well, Guillermo did a fantastic role. As if you've seen, a the fantastic, movie. fantastic, yeah. like. Kudos to you. I mean, you literally, I was sobbing when you were pounding your fists on that steering wheel. Like that just took me down because I think we've all been there, you know, in our lives where we're really questioning and we're really crying out to God and we're just, you know, and you you really did um, nail it. What was your process, uh, Guillermo, when, what was your audition like? What, how many, you know, what, what was that like? Was that Tell me about that, because I, I, you know, I'm an actress. I've been in movies and I've done the whole auditioning thing, and and that can be frustrating. And you get a part like this, Guillermo, and you go, "Wow, yeah. this is it, right?" Well, you have no idea how happy I feel when I when I listen to your words, and when I when I realize that you know the movie's creating that impact in in people as well, because at the end of the day what we do as actors is just one component of the whole thing, right? And I think that, uh, you know, and I'm saying this with, with uh, humble tea, you know, all we do is we're just putting like one piece of the whole puzzle and it has to be magic. And I think I credit that to Pedro because he's, he's the creator. He's the one who triggers all that. So uh, let me go back to the audition process. There was no audition process. It was, it was basically having conversations with Pedro. I mean, we, uh, we got on the phone the first time, and it was just like this. You know, it was like a magic 
encounter, even though we, we never met physically, you know, at that time, but we had a call and it was like, it lasted for an hour almost. And we continued having conversations every day and every day. And we, we kept talking about the character and we kept, we kept talking about Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, I was born in Mexico and Lady of Guadalupe as a symbol represents a lot of things to me as well. Like when I was like four or five years old, my great grandmother used to take me to see Lady of Guadalupe as an act of faith. And regardless of religion, you know, like it has nothing to do with, you know, the religion you follow or your your conception of God or your theology position or, you know, ontological perspective of the world. It really has to do with understanding what faith means. And, and to me, faith is the certainty on those things that are not there, but you can sense them. You can feel them. You as an actress, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you understand that very well. Because if you, as an actor, if you don't have faith, there's nothing in front of you. There's nothing. I mean, you, you have to create from, from nothing, basically. So we have lots of conversations. We had, uh, we spent several hours over the phone. Uh, and, and, and I realized that Pedro was not only an incredible director, but an amazing human being and that he had something to be said, that he had a strong message, which in my opinion portrays in movie as well, you know, because if, if your message, if the reason why you're doing something is to put that little piece of faith out there to remind people that if you believe it, if you see it in your mind, you can achieve it as well, regardless of how many times you have failed or how many times you have tried or how many times you know, it's been dark in front of you, but you believe that you can get through it. And even when doctors are telling you the opposite or when whomever is telling you the opposite, there is a chance. And it's a way you connect to the universe or to God, if you want to call it that way, or to whatever that is. So, you know, the whole process was incredible. And then after, you know, a month of, of conversations over the phone, when, when pe we finally met, Pedro and myself and the rest of the team for a tech scout. It was incredible because we had the chance to to start building the character from pre-production. You know, I remember the first time we went to a location and we started doing like camera tests and we, you know, I was there. I was I had the, the fortune to be involved in all that all that pre-production process with the rest of the team. And it was it was amazing because we started finding Juan Diego in the past and John Martinez in the present, and and that's uh, you know that's what triggered the rest of of the things basically. Was this the movie shot? I'm sorry, in Mexico, or was it shot a lot of it shot here? It was shot in New Mexico and New Mexico. also in the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, I mean, Guillermo's tremendously humble. You, you probably noticed by by I now. know, I see uh, that. Um, because uh, you see, um, Juan Diego and the Lady of Guadalupe is such an icon in the Latin culture that when somebody could offer you a role to play something like that, well, you will feel the the, the weight of the world in your shoulders, like tremendous pressure, because it's iconic. You got it can mortalize you, but in a good way or a bad way. So. Um, that's why there was really no audition. I knew uh, Guillermo's uh, capacities from his past work was astonishing. Uh, but I, I wanted to ease in the process of like, hey, you're going to play uh, Juan Diego and, and John Martinez. Uh, they're like 500 years apart. And, um, no and it's, a, it's, a, it's a really vulnerable character. But you know? he never told me that I was playing the part. Just <laughs> a side note. I mean, it was been like a month over the phone. And he never told me that I, I was playing that part. I love it. No, it I it, love that. It, it, I think more directors will do should do stuff like that. They should uh, interact with their actors and let like get to learn their value system and their structure. Because I mean, there's so many actors, but actors who have the capacity to be vulnerable the way Guillermo was in this movie and put himself out there and be so generous with all the other actors. Because he raised the level of, of every other actor in there too. Mm. Oh it, it, wow, it's rare. Gamma. It's rare. It's rare. Uh, you know, like I also want to like shout out to Paola Baldion who who create uh, who, who played Lady of Guadalupe, uh, which is she's the one who says have a little faith. Yeah, as you like yeah. mentioned, 
she also did an extraordinary role. Really difficult, really complex to do too, because well, um, you know, it's like playing an, like an extraterrestrial, like like somebody who's from a different world. So it's not that that easy to play deities. It's complicated. No, it, I, yeah, I mean, but you also sometimes in life and in when you believe in God, you take a leap of faith, you know. And God works all things together for good, and He brings people in our path. So there's, I'm sure, there was a level of of that faith where that I talk about this every episode, where it's that check in your spirit that guides you. You just know when you know, you know. And so it seems like that's there was a, a little bit of that that went on here, you know. Too obviously, Guillermo, you're extremely. To both of you are extremely talented. I mean, just the direction. It was beautifully shot, and. Um, it, down to the editing. I mean, you know, if you really want to dissect a, a project, you can look at that and see that you really got the message across. And this movie is based on true events, but it talks about curses and miracles. And I believe in miracles. I do. I've seen miracles. And we are a miracle, right? We ourselves are a miracle. Um, tell us a little bit about the story without giving all of it away because we want people to watch this movie. But just tell us a point in the process for you directing and you acting in it where, you know, just give us something that is magical that might have happened on set. You know, I don't know if you saw the passion of of the Christ, yeah, of but course. with Mel Gibson, but he said there were so many amazing moments behind the scenes. Yeah, right? I'm sure. Um, tell us if there are any of those moments on, on your film. I'm always well, fascinated by behind the uh, camera. I have to tell you that we could sit down for uh, three or four hours with the whole crew to tell you the things that happened. There was, I cannot explain it. I, I, I look, I have to be clear with you. I am uh, pretty conservative when it comes to like finding miracles. I don't find them in the, in the French toast or people find miracles everywhere. I, I am I'm a little more skeptical of, of things like that, but so many coincidences happen uh, during the movie that it's impossible for it to be a coincidence. Guillermo has some stories. I have some stories. I can tell you that almost everybody who was involved in a movie was drawn into, into the movie by a form of energy that it's difficult to explain, but it was present all the time. I, I, I'm telling you. like it. I feel it. I'm telling you. You can watch it and see that. I can, so, for example, the first, day, the first day that we started shooting, right? Guillermo has a great story, obviously, when, when he uh, got the news that he was going to be Juan Diego. We can tell you that one. But let me tell you, when we started okay. shooting, when we started, the day that we started shooting, there were, but the moment that we said action, a thunderstorm started happening. 63 lighting hits, like, got, like, hit around us. None, like, where we were, I mean, besides the rain, nothing happened. Like, really, really crazy stuff that is, like, supernatural but at the same time like so many stories of people like were connected in a way or the lady of guadalupe like save his mom's dad like everybody somehow was connected to lady of guadalupe granted obviously it's a latino culture and the lady of guadalupe were well connected but this was more than that this was like definitely a, a presence of, of 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 that you know like i almost uh i almost died during the filming you know i had like really bad car, bad car accident uh, and nothing happened to me. Like I got out of there, like without a scratch, like really, really crazy stuff. Like, I, like I said, it will take us, like you will need to do three, four parts of the show to like just go through the whole thing. I think that those are the important parts of, you know, people don't re sometimes people don't understand what it takes to put a movie or a production together. You know, they just, you go to the theater and you see the final work, right? But for us, we have see behind the scenes. And for me, personally, I'm always looking. I do see I do see the miracle in the French toast. I literally will f send my my friends pictures. Oh, there's, you know, the I poured the syrup and God made a heart, that kind of thing. But um, and it doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, that's why I asked, because, you know, something like this, that's so powerful, this movie that's based on true events. You know, I always say new level, new devil, and maybe the enemy tries to kind of, you know, get in there and, and stop the production in some way. But it sounds like, you know, there was a force greater than the enemy, God. Well, I'm gonna tell you another you. quick story and then Guillermo should tell you the story of, of what okay. happened to him because it's a really good story. Um, you know, the day that I knew that this movie was gonna happen, 
was when um, I was uh, close to finishing the script. And at that time I was, uh, because uh, a contract that I had, I was in Rockford, Illinois. Rockford, Illinois is a complicated city where there's a lot of hate between uh, uh, the people that live in the city of different r racial hate. And um, for, because of that, there's a lot of gang activity and it, it's, it's, it's violent. Pretty much all the, all, the, um, all the gangs and all the problematic situations that were happening in, in Chicago with the projects, they send all that people to Rockford. So Rockford mm -hmm. became kind of like Flint, Michigan, a really complicated city. And I was living there without knowing. It's the first time I'm there. And I'm writing my script. And, and there's like gangs and there's bullets flying. I'm not kidding you about this. Like I wrote the script hiding behind a, a metal <laughs> stove. Well, well, I was finishing because I saw bullets fly. Like they, they killed some people outside of uh, oh my where, I used, where I used to live. So when that happened, that's when I realized, you know what? Like if this can't stop this script... Like nothing's gonna stop. That's that's when I had the certainty, and this is years before funding or anything, that the movie will happen. No, well, again, I, I love I, that. That's like a, that's a perfect example of what I was just saying. That's so great. I mean, it's not because bullets flying in any situation is not great, but you're right. It was kind of a, it was kind of the the preface to you know what was to come. And, and okay, it, is that hope. it is that hope that keeps you yeah. going. You know, when, when you're in that difficult circumstances, if you don't go through those cir difficult circumstances as a writer, it's difficult for you to be able to like put it in a movie. So yeah. like going through that, I was like, okay, well, this is, this is when hope is needed. You know, it's, it's, if, it's, it's easy for people who are, you know, like well off or comfortable in life. They can well spare faith or hope, you know, like they probably don't need it. But when things get tough, hope is it's the glue that keeps our society together that's why this movie is so important you know? it Again, is you're I, right ask Guillermo about this he has a great great story you Guillermo, know? I'd love <laughs> to know <laughs> some of your stories <laughs> well first of all I, I just I just want to I, I want to quote someone uh, and it's all related to what you were saying you know the the relationship that you established with the concept of faith, hope, and miracle. Einstein, as everybody knows, was a, a man of science. And uh, he has a beautiful quote that says, and I'm, 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 I'm not paraphrasing 100% correctly here, but he says something like, you have two different ways to live your life and perceive reality knowing that everything is a miracle or knowing that ev or knowing that nothing is a miracle and i think he was he was right in every sense you know uh the reason why i wanted to quote that is because to me john martinez in the present time goes from thinking and perceiving or you know having the perception of reality as if nothing was a miracle and throughout the arc of the story, he realizes that everything in life is a miracle. And it really has to do with the way you celebrate life and the way you perceive life. And as I said, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with religion. It has to, with, it has to do with your philosophy, with your position in life, with the way you perceive and the perspective you have of the universe. So that being said, I want to tell you a story that Pedro was uh, mentioning uh, when Pedro and I started having having conversations about uh, potentially working on, on Lady of Guadalupe, as I said, he never mentioned that he wanted me to play Juan Diego and John Martinez. We were just having conversations about the plot, the, the importance of the story, uh, the possibility of working together, you know, and it was great. It was fine because you know, nobody was pretending anything. I was not even pretending to to play Juan Diego. You know, when we were having those conversations, I was truly, fully in love with a with a with a project and with the possibility of working with them. Because you, as an actor, understand when there is this chemistry with a director. You know, it's like a dancing partner. You, you know that very yes. well. I mean, when you find yes. that, it's just it's magic. You know, it's like dancing with with somebody. And, and you connect through intuition instead of the rational process. So, you know, that dancing was happening throughout every conversation over the phone. But he never told me that I was playing, playing Juan Diego. So I went down to Mexico to visit my family. 
And you know how it is. I mean, when you're back home, uh, your mom spoils you. You know, you don't have to do your bed. You don't have to do anything. You wake up and you have breakfast in front of you. Everything is nice and clean and whatever. Yeah. So, you know, I continue having conversations with Pedro in the meantime. But, uh, uh, you know, one day after two weeks or so in Mexico, uh, I woke up. And I, you know, I went to, uh, to exercise in the morning and I, I don't know why I was feeling kind of lost. It was one of those days where you're trying to find the right, the right thing to do next in your life, you know? And, and I was just like, I had a conversation. I tried to meditate before I work out every morning. And I, I kind of had, I had a conversation with the universe with, god or whatever you want to call it and i said can you just give me a sign i mean just tell me tell me where to go tell me what's next and uh and whatever i mean that happened in the morning i worked out and then i had a great conversation with my father and then you know uh uh, like around 6 p.m or something mexican time pedro calls me and he's like well you know what i just wanted to let you know that everything has been settled and we're moving forward and you're playing Juan Diego and you're playing John Martinez. And it was crazy. I mean, the, you know, I, I never told Pedro this at that time. And I tried to be cool with him over the phone, <laughs> but I had tears in my eyes. I don't yeah. know why. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I, I knew why, you know, it, I, I felt that it was an answer to what I was trying to get, but I had, uh, I could, my mom is asking me, what's going on? Is this good? Is this bad? Because they just saw me crying, you know, and they, they didn't know what was going on. My dad is asking me as well, what's, what's happening? Well, you know, what was all about? And I was like, I need a second. I need a second. Then I'll tell you everything. So I went to my bathroom. And as I said, you know, all that time, like about two weeks, I've been there spoiled by mom and she's been, you know, doing my best. And then for whatever reason, I moved the sheets and I found this blanket with the Lady of Guadalupe in my bed. So my mom had me sleeping in that bed and she knew nothing about it. She didn't know that I was having conversations with Pedro. It was, and I and uncovered God. the bed <laughs> and it was late. It was the Lady of Guadalupe. The, like a huge blanket of Lady of Guadalupe. So just like Juan Diego, because if you watch a movie, you realize that the teal man was protect was embracing Juan Diego, you know, and he didn't know. My mom had me sleeping on this blanket every night for two weeks, and she had no idea that I was having a conversation with Pedro about potentially working on this project. That's what I'm talking about. (laughs) That's literally what I'm talking about. That is, to me, that is, that is a divine, you know, appointment, and that's God's hand in it, and on it completely, right? I I think Guillermo forgot one little detail. Uh, Guillermo's dad is a a fantastic painter, Helasio. Yeah, Uh, but like really fantastic painter, and uh, when Guillermo arrived to his house in that visit later, I, I found out about this. He kept he coming to his house, and there's this huge Lady of Guadalupe painted in the wall. And, and he's like, what is this? And his dad's like, oh, well, I just wanted to paint a Lady of Guadalupe, so I painted here in the wall next to the stairs. You know? So it's, it's l- those little things. Like, you find this image everywhere. I remember being in a diner before arriving to the pre-production, and the, the woman that's serving us has a, a tattoo of the Lady of Guadalupe on this side of the arm which is the only thing that I can see of her when she's serving. I'm like, okay, I'm being served by Lady Guadalupe. This is crazy. (laughs) It's (laughs) It's like, you know, God God does those things and it's like, you know, you're on the right path, right? They're called little God winks, but that's not little. That's like a blanket. (laughs) Yeah, That's incredible. That's a great story. So, so then from beginning to end, how long did the movie take to make? Uh, six weeks. It was the the, the shooting six schedule. Weeks? Well, each modern movies most well, filming take six weeks. No, I know. I mean, well, we, uh, we had a we had a week of pre production and then we had some post production. Uh, wow. Okay, so I wanted to ask: Was this filmed? I know it was released in twenty twenty. Was it filmed during COVID? 
No, I was. We finished it right before the the pandemic. I have to tell you that I, I feel like uh, we were hit by the by the like COVID when we were filming. Like half of our crew like got sick, and it didn't stop us. We continued watching the, making the movie. Yeah, it was really really crazy. We were wow. in Mexico when that happened. You know? Let me tell you uh, something that um, for you to <clears throat> to understand the, the testament of the capacities of uh, of Guillermo. So uh, part of our like half of our crew and, and camera crew were veterans of Iraq. Like these are hardened people who work in the industry. These are not like people that are like sentimental in any way. And th the rest of the people are people that have been doing movies for 25 years. Like these are people that have been in all the dramas you can imagine. They don't get touchy or emotional with anything. That scene that you mentioned with the car, it's been the hardest thing that I've directed in my life. Uh, because I had to keep composure. I remember I was choking a Red Bull and trying to like keep composure. Every single member of the crew was crying. Like these are people who came back from Iraq. Like these are people who are hardened in, 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 or people who have been in the industry that they have seen actors cry. No, no, no. I'm telling you like everybody, like not a dry eye. It was intense. At, like the, I, the I, I have the text. I watched it and I, I sent the text to Bob. I said, I said, just watch the trailer. I'm sobbing. It's so quick, but you know, for an actor, Guillermo Bravo, um, and director, uh, Pedro, for, for someone to get to that point where even in, in just less than 30 seconds, I could see in a trailer to invoke the emotion where I actually did cry. And Bob knows like, you know, yeah, you well, I do cry, but that took me quickly to that space. Um, it's really uh, a beautiful testament to both of you, you know, uh, having a comfortable space for you to be in that moment, Guillermo, and, and of course, listening to the director. The director sets the tone, and I'm going to speak on that for one second because Guillermo talked about that. It's like a dance. It's a relationship. And I've been on sets where, you know, the director is, it's not so nice, and it really puts the actor in a position of fear and it almost can stifle you in in those scenes right where you're just jacked up mentally because you're in your head and you know but when you have a director it's like having having a very supportive angel mom dad whatever coming alongside you and gently and not helping you navigate this character to life right and you were able to do that honestly it, it just took me down so well bravo. the way i see it <clears throat> me as a director of my i understand I, I, I was an actor once in my life you know when i started really early and I was poorly directed and, and I felt really, really vulnerable and lonely because it's a, it's a lonely thing. At the end of the day, acting is a lonely thing, um, a, a lonely situation. So to me as a director, I understand that acting is a chemical process. Like you are manipulating chemical things in your body that make you feel here and there. At least the, great, the, the good actors do that. So uh, I understand that my role as a director is to be there for you. So um, you, are, you know that you're not alone and you're comfortable. So the, the truth is that most of the directing happens before you're on set. Like directors who direct on set, I respect them. That's, that's their own style. But I direct weeks before. Like Guillermo and me were having uh, talks about the nature of Juan Diego. If he was a character like Gandhi or, or St. Thomas or like a, a, any of these great ideologies that, that came before him. He, he was a guy who came from a warrior uh, family and he uh, opted to be peaceful and be, have faith, you know, and, and be hopeful. Instead of like, yeah, let's kill the Spanish. Without Juan Diego, there wouldn't be Mexico, there wouldn't be Latinos, there wouldn't be tacos, just saying. You know? So <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like, my goal is definitely to be there chemically with with somebody that I understand they're in a journey where they're like you know like it, it's a delicate balance and I believe that it's difficult for people to unless you are a, a director and you have experience acting it's difficult to understand how vulnerable it is to be in front of the camera naked with your emotions raw having a director that is just giving you poor directions like hey a little more of this a little less of that like, give me more of this and that it's just it's just bad for the poor actor and so I, I, I understand that um, what is my role in there and, 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 I, and I do it. But be, before that, what I do is like, we take the time to ideologically immerse 
in, in the character. And that's, I think, what helps a lot. But hey, I have to say, it also takes a kind of actor that wants to do that, that ha wants to create the leg work for him to be ready on the first shot when you say action. You know, and, and, and Guillermo, for example, it was like that. It's just funny, you know, because we will be working and after working, we'll drive to back to the hotel and, and we were like talking about like tomorrow and or, or the day before. And we were talking about all these things that was more about the internal ideological buildup of the, of the characters and the situations and than, than anything else, you know, so it, that that helped a lot. No doubt. But but and I'll I'll let, I want Guillermo to t to speak on this because for an actor, when you do show up and the director says that day, you're kind of put on the spot. But when you do work with someone for a week or six weeks or whatever, you get to marinate in the direction, and it literally becomes second nature, as opposed to pulling that response immediately and making it look authentic. Guillermo, speak to that. I c I couldn't agree more with you. I mean. Uh... And, and, you know, it, it really, it, it, it makes me feel very excited to, to hear that from you because it, to me, that's a real job. That's a job that has to be done. You know, like the actor's work does not happen on set, in my opinion. What happens on set in front of the camera is just the result. The real work happens weeks after weeks before i'm sorry when you're having those conversations with the director when you're working by yourself when you're just digging into your persona trying to unveil what's inside you know when you're connecting the dots you know internally when you're you know uh, when you're transferring things to the character that that's that's a real job and 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 then you know, having the opportunity of doing that with somebody else, uh, you know, in this case with Pedro as an ally, you know, during all those conversations. And then, uh, you know, it, like with him, every time we we had a call, which was basically every day because, you know, I wasn't sad every day in the movie. Uh, Six o'clock in the morning, and we were driving. We were driving. Well, he was driving to a location, and we were already having conversations. Like it, it was spent like an hour before we get on set, talking about the scenes that we were shooting that day, and you know, we had already had prior conversations, you know, and we had been talking about some uh, some other stuff. But but as Pedro as Pedro was explaining, those conversations were like more they were coming from the philosophical foundation of the character. You know, sometimes we were talking about, uh, we were talking history or we were talking jazz and we were connecting jazz with, you know, whatever was happening, you know, with Juan Diego at this present stage or whatever. I mean, it was crazy. Some, some people, you know, in the car, they were just looking at us like, who are these crazy guys talking about like, old, like most of the time, <laughs> I guarantee you people, didn't understand what we were trying to, what we were trying to portray, you know, and, and, and yeah, go for it. Well, sometimes people don't understand when you shoot a movie, you know, you, there's a script, right? And I was actually shocked when I first came to LA and I had a, a real script, you know, when I was a, a lot younger and I didn't get it. And this might sound silly, but oftentimes it, the, the actual script is shot out of sequence. So in other words, you might shoot the end first, depending mm -hmm. on the location, right? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't, you don't just shoot it from beginning to end. And so that scene where you're just pounding on the steering wheel and you're like, why? Like, you know, when was that scene? It makes me want to cry now just watching you. I see your sweet little face right there and I can just see it in that moment. <laughs> what? It's true. It's like, you. it's forever etched. Um, was that the be when did you film that scene? Was that in the beginning of shooting? Was it in the middle? Is it in the end? And in that moment, what were you thinking about? Well, this is this is the beauty of working with somebody like Pedro. <sighs> that scene was not in the script. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh no! I'm really gonna you're gonna take me down. <laughs> so no, but this is the beauty of that. You know, that scene came out of those conversations that we were having every day. Because Pedro was so open to listen and to receive, you know, that, you know, that 
that actually happened. That was created in the moment. So, you know, one day we were having conversations all the time and we were talking about the arc of the character and what's going on with John. And, you know, we were trying to find the right moment, the, 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 the breaking down point that would just make him go to his knees and say, I'm done. You know, this is rock bottom. Like there is, I cannot continue. Like I have fallen all the way. There is not, there is nothing yeah. left here. And not until you get to that point, sometimes you, you give yourself permission to feel faith and to embrace that faith. Right. So Pedro and I, we were talking about that all the time, trying to find that right, the right place, you know, to, to, to hit that note. And then one day we had enough time. This is six o'clock in the morning. And then we're having a conversation as always. And then, you know, it was an easy day. And Pedro's like, we have time today. Why don't we do something different? And we started talking about that scene. And we started to imagine that scene. And Pedro's like, yes, I know where to put it. Let's do it. But it was not on the script. So that day, we just had like three, four hours. And Pedro imagined the scene. We talked about it. We went to the location. And we just... And, and it, was, it, was, it was really nice from him because he said, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're coming from the hospital. You're getting in the car. And then you have that moment. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever happens, happens. So I'm just going to put the cameras and let's see what happens. And that's basically what happened. You know, we, we, we knew that we needed to hit rock bottom, you know, with Joe, John Martinez. We knew that we... We needed to get a character down there so he could really understand that the only way out is faith. There, like, there is no more space for rationalization of things. I mean, you have to be humble enough from now on to say, I'm here. You know, whatever you want me to do, I will take it and I will do it and I will learn. So, you know... What, what were was you I thinking, thinking though? Yeah. Because I'm <laughs> well, telling you, Guillermo, I'm not just saying this to make you feel good. It really, you really nailed it. And and all I keep hearing in my head for some reason is freedom, freedom, freedom. Pedro gave mm. you the freedom to yeah. tap into, call on, create, you know, respond, all the, the words above. I have to say that that's where I'd say that the bravery of Guillermo of, of being vulnerable like that, because a lot of other actors will not want to like swing a scene that wasn't on the script. And, and we needed that scene and in, in the conversation we had prior, and this is why we came to that scene probably a year before God, uh, is that we needed that intimate moment. Like Juan Diego has that when Juan Diego goes and says, thank you to the place where he will meet the lady of Guadalupe, although she's not there. He goes and cries and says, thank you, mother. Right. We didn't have that for the character of the modern day in, in John Martinez. So we needed a breather where, because, it, you know, like the, the character is not just the husband, the father, the reporter. It, it also has to have a moment just for himself. And, um, and so we thought, well, you know what? Like, how about like he just gets in the car and takes a moment for himself. At this point, I realized that the whole, um, emotional structure of the character is already embedded in Guillermo. We're, we have shot half of the movie. Like he completely feels, talks, emanates. He is John Martinez, you know? And, and, uh, and that's why I said, Hey, look, we're just going to put the cameras, whatever goes, goes, you know, let's see what comes out. Let's, let's try it out. And you saw that. Power Aren't you blown it. away? I was blown away. Oh, but what, what yeah. were you thinking about Guillermo? <laughs> I, I, if, that was if, I can be, if I can be very, if I can be very honest with you, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Mm. I, I, I just, uh, I just, you know, I, I was just trying to be in a moment. I was just trying to place myself in John Martinez's shoes, and I being there. I think that we all have been there at least once in life. You know, we all have hit. <clears throat> rock bottom at least once in life and if we haven't we will because that's life and uh and i just you know i was just reconnecting with with 
those moments as well. And I was trying to understand, uh, not even understand, I was trying to embrace and feel what I felt. But as a John Martinez in those circumstances, and and that's what what happened. Um, I, I don't I don't I wish I could explain rationally, you know, what was happening or logically what was happening, but I, I can't. I, I can just, you know, tell you what I what you know, what I was feeling and not even that, but you know, what what my what the process was, you know, and I was just like I was just allowing myself myself to be vulnerable, as Pedro was saying, you know, by placing myself in, in those circumstances. And, you know, it's the perfect thing because oftentimes I have children, a child. I don't know if either of you have a child. Children. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. No. It's much like um, God has really used my child to cultivate and um, kind of um, explain the, the, you know, father daughter relationship, daughter, I have a daughter, mother daughter relationship. And it's like, you know, when they're, when kids are like two to five, that's their number one question. Why? (laughs) Why? 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 And so it was very, when I saw that scene, I know we keep talking about that scene, but when I saw it, it made me look at it from a child's like perspective, right? Like I'm asking my father, why? You know, why you're just crying out to God, which is a very valid thing to do. Um, is to, to question. But anyway, I, I, I'm i totally going on about that scene. And whoever's listening, please watch this movie, Lady of Guadalupe, because it's so powerful. Um, just the whole, all of it, just the fact that you were picked up by the Pope as a young child, Pedro, right? I was. And then it's like, an, it's an anointed, this movie, in so many, on so many levels. Um, you know, the Bible says, uh, um, in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, for I know the plans uh, I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not harm you, to give you hope in a future. And it's like he knew this plan back then when he picked you up as a little boy that he'd be you'd be here, right? Talking about this movie that you directed that is talks about curses and miracles and and just all of it. It unites us all, as it says in this trailer. Um, uh, you know. It- but before we, we, we change the theme, I just want to say, like, the character of John Martinez asks why. Like, he literally crying, like, ask why. <clears throat> but he's not asking why, like, why me or why are you punishing me, Lord, or anything like that. He really is questioning, like, what have I done wrong? Right. Like, I work hard, you know, like, I, I am trying to, like, like keep it together and, and have a life and have love and, and have a family. And, and suddenly everything falls apart. And that happens to a lot of people. Like, it doesn't matter if you've done right or wrong, things just fall apart. And, and sometimes that's when you need hope the most because it really takes you, uh, like, by surprise, you know, that something like that happens. The scene was so intense that even the guards of the hospital came out. They thought that, yeah. that somebody was, like, like, jumped from the building or something had happened. Because, you know, in hospitals, when people die, some people get really upset. So they thought it was a real thing, and that like, wow, the guards got tears in his eyes. Like it was, it was. Wow, no, like, it's that impactful. It is. It was a real moment of life, and and it it was it was a character that was there. Like like, Guillermo was in full full character. Like I can tell you, ninety nine percent of of what was there, or a hundred percent, was the character. It was, oof, really. Wow, you know, I know, Bob. You you took you down too. He's going yes, like this. I, um, Guillermo. Yeah. I have another question for you, Guillermo. You, did you know, did you always know that you wanted to act? Is, was this something that when you, as a kid, you had this passion? Because it really does take, you know, you have to really want to go and, and toe-to-toe with rejection, right? I mean, really, at the end of the day, most actors have been through, um, and directors, all of us in this industry, as in life, have gone through a lot of rejection to get to this good stuff. Right. True. That's yeah. True. Yeah. Uh, well, let me tell you about. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you about that. Uh, when I was like about six years old, I I was with my parents, uh, and I was watching a movie called Awakenings with Robert Nero and Robin Williams, 
And I was so impressed and I was so moved by their performance. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, but it's, uh-huh. it's an incredible, incredible movie. And what Robert Nero was doing at that time and Robin Williams he really touched my heart. And I was like, I remember that when the movie was over, I turned to my mom and I said, I want to do that. Like, I want to be able to do that. Meaning, I want to be able to touch someone, you know, throughout whatever that is that we do in front of the screen and leave a message because that movie changed my perception of life as well, you know? Um, and it was not a movie for a six year old kid, you know? But I was going to say, that's it, a very... Uh, yeah not adult but it's just yeah that's amazing it's intense it's very intense and uh, and then title is kind of symbolic of what happened to you in that moment you had an awakening that's right that's right but but paradoxically i at that time i was into sports and i wanted to be an athlete and but I started acting when I was six and I started doing a lot of soap operas in Mexico because, you know, in Mexico, you have to do soap operas at some point in time. So it was, I was a kid and whatever, but I was not taking it serious. When I, when he was 14, when I was 14 years old, uh, funny enough, my, my best friend who was also an athlete passed away. He, uh, you know, we were training together. We were like brothers and whatever. And then he, something happened to him, you know, in his leg and whatever. And then he got cancer and he passed away when, when he was 14. And that changed my life because, uh, coincidentally, I got a scholarship to, to go to Cuba and study acting in Cuba. So I moved to Cuba and I, when I was 14 and I, you know, I devoted myself to the art of acting and that that was a life changing moment. And I went through starvation and poverty by myself for Did you I was gonna years. say, did you move away from your parents? You went yeah. to Cuba by yourself yeah. at fourteen. Fourteen, yeah. Wow. I spent seven years, you know, doing nothing but just studying the craft and, and starving basically and dancing salsa. You know, that was there as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I so it was love great. That. It was great, and then you know that that was the moment when I realized that you know this is this is this is the reason why I'm here, and no matter what, and you know I don't care if I get rejected several times, you know, you know it's always a sign. It's always like it, it, you know if you take everything as a miracle, you realize that all all that's happening is that you know, the universe is kind of protecting you from being on a place where you don't have to be. That's it. This is not for you. It's, you know, something else. Just continue your journey and your path and you will find the right thing, you know. And that that applies to every director, uh, you know, actor, musician, because we all face rejection, you know, all the time. And sometimes it doesn't even matter where you are in your career you know you could be successful and and still get rejected by by big time studio or whatever that is so you know you just have to follow your journey and realize that you know whatever has to be and whenever it has to be it will be and uh so i always tell my daughter god's rejection is god's protection yeah yeah there you go yes yes hey look Everything is perception, you know. Uh, Einstein was was right when he was when he was quoting that quote, or when he was saying that quote, and and he was also right about the relativity theory because it it's all connected to the perce- the, the the perception and the place where you're relatively relating yourself to the world. You know, if you're seeing the train from the outside and the train is going 100 miles an hour, it is different as if you're in the train, you know, you're moving right. with the train. So it's all perspective. So if you change your perspective and if you realize that it's not whatever you think is bad or wrong, you know, in the present moment because you have been rejected or because this is not coming to you and you wanted it. 
there must be a reason for that. You know, that reason might be you're not prepared for that. And the universe or God is, you know, protecting you. Or this is not for you, you know. and But you still have to go through all that to get to the right destination. Now, the, the, what's really difficult is understanding all that because we, we're kind of spoiled. And when we want something, we want it now, right? We, yes, we totally. It's hard. Patience it is a virtue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're right. You're right. Um, two things, though. Do you still have that blanket? And can I borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, there is a video of that blanket because really? when that when I discovered that, I took a video and I sent it to Pedro. And the other day, he sent it back to me. So, can you, you know, send it to us? And can we put Bob will put it in this episode if yeah. we can. Okay, good. Because I, I just want to see it. I just want to see that blanket. So and then the, um, the blanket, uh, like all, all of these things, are to me a, a testament that what it's, yeah. what it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a French uh, toast. And it, it's the same, like how the whole team came together. Like we have a really diverse cast, but it's so funny because it, when you think about Hollywood, like the Latinos are present because they build the sets, they they feed everybody, they do a lot of things, but when it comes to like directing besides two or three directors and when it comes to like executive charges or producers or whatever, there's not a lot of Latinos in there, like the, the higher positions, you know, like, um, like what I said, like what, what it's meant to be, it's meant to be like, <clears throat> we ended with a movie that has all this cast with Latinos. It's starting from the, 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 the financier, like secret producer and producer, uh, Robert Heimers, who, who paid for the movie, you know, uh, Latino, you know, and, and then it, you keep going down and down and down. It's just this collection of, of Latinos or Latinos mixed with something or whatever. It's so, so interesting that it was meant to be like that. It was the same when, when I was casting Guillermo. There were some other actors in there and we needed, we needed to let those offers expire because I, I wanted Guillermo, but I couldn't disclose it to him. But, you know, so Guillermo was meant to be like that role was so when I was writing it, the universe was like, this is the guy who's going to play it, you know, like something like that, if you want to see it like that. And this is the guy who's going to finance the movie. It happens like that. So it, the blanket's a really good example of what's meant to be, it's meant to be. A blanket, sequel, that's a sequel. Guillermo, <laughs> <laughs> you got the role. I think we, you've got your, yeah, you're good. The blanket. Lady. The blanket, of lady. Lady. yeah, I mean, I so, I mean, so it, it aired, a release was released in the beginning of the pandemic and where can we see it? We can see it on Amazon and it, it's in all VOD platforms. You know, okay. and you can see it on Amazon, Apple TV and all the other ones, you know, and uh, it will be released in DVD too. It was in theaters and it had a sneak peek on, on TV, you know, and that's what we want definitely is for people to see it, <clears throat> to receive that hope more now than ever because, well, we went through a, crazy pandemic and i believe that uh, latinos got hit really really hard you know by by that pandemic so uh yeah. how did it how did we, it do in the theaters um well, you don't have to give me numbers because we released a movie on october 2nd mm -hmm. and it, it was interesting because you know normally you'll see a trailers of movies like the movie you're about to see if the horror movie you see horror trailers super movies you see superman movies uh, we released a movie called heaven which was a feel-good family movie and there were like maybe four other movies running. This is October of 2020. And the trailers that ran for us were like um, Wonder Woman, 84, and then another like uh, superhero movie, and then some movie about a horror movie. And we were like a good family-friendly heaven movie. So how, how did it run and how did you wind up getting it into theaters? Because it was really hard during the pandemic. Well, I mean, I have to say that um, Lady of Guadalupe, it's if you make a movie about certain things, it just they have a the path like paved, you know. Like I, I don't want to say that it was it, it took some negotiations and stuff like that, but most people are really receptive and 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 welcoming of the Lady of Guadalupe because it, it plays uh, such a important quintessential role in the Latino culture. Look, if you know the story of Lady of Guadalupe, if you watch this movie, I promise that it's a Rosetta Stone. Like you will understand the Latino culture. You will understand why the food is this way, why the Latinos are this way. And if you understand Latinos, you will obviously 
be able to like mingle and interact with them and, and, and have better tacos if you want to see like that. But, but the, the reality is that the movie talks about that. So when we were going into theaters, the theaters were like happy, you know, and, and we did put it on December 12th, you know, because it's the day of Lady of Guadalupe and uh, in theaters in Mexico and, and selected theaters in the US. And then we had a quick sneak peek on, on TV and then we put it again uh, you know, on, on April out in, in theaters, and now it's on BOD. Um, so far, like, you know, like, like I said, when you do something pure and real, um, you don't get bad reviews, or you don't get, you know, I mean, like, it, it's just people, you know, uh, uh, people just, like, like it. You know, I think the only comment that I was like, hmm, that somebody told me is like, it's predictable. I go like, well, that story happened 500 years ago. It's kind of like, you know, <laughs> it's... <laughs> People know that story already, but they don't know the story of, of, of John Martinez, you know. So the truth is that people love the story. They find it tremendously inspirational. And, and that was our intention from the get-go, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, from everybody that, that, that was in this movie, from Guillermo, me, financing, you name it, you know, everybody involved in it. We didn't uh, knew that the pandemic was coming. We didn't knew that... Uh, uh, we didn't know that that the movie was going to play such an important role, you know. And because when you need help and you cannot leave your house, well, I guess at least you can watch a movie of that thing that gives you hope and release. And what better than Lady Guadalupe for for all the Latins? And so, I'm going to ask this question to both of you guys: um, What's next for for you, Pedro, and for you, Guillermo? I'm fans. I'm sold. Uh -huh. I'm not of Hispanic descent, but if you have a, a role, I'm there. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Guillermo tell you all that, but I can tell you that we definitely enjoy, we'll have a friendship and we definitely enjoy working together. And, and, and these things happen both ways, you know, like from the director to the actor and the actor to the director, kind of like you, you, there's so many stories of like that dynamic duo, right? Like you have Scorsese with De Niro and yeah. all the movies they've done together and then they're friends and everything they do, they kind of like do together, you know? So me and Guillermo have a, a good thing going on, like a good chemistry like that, you know? And we're definitely working in, uh, in, a, in a new project, but I'll, I'll let you tell you a little more about it so we can both tell you. No, I mean, as Pedro was saying, the, when, you, when you find someone that uh, you can dance with, you know, without even thinking about it, then you want to keep that dance partner as well, you know? So uh, Pedro and I were working already in at least three, four different projects right now. There is one in particular that uh, we cannot tell you that much right now, unfortunately, but it's, it's, it's coming, it's coming. And, and, and we have, you know, we have more than one uh, in the open. So, you know, hopefully we can work together at a certain point. It will be phenomenal. You and me? Or you mean you? Yeah. He, oh, yeah. He, he means Pedro. Yeah. <laughs> no, he means me, Bob. Uh, me. I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's talking to me. Um, well, we've yes. tried your English accent. We've tried your Australian <laughs> accent. Do you have a Latino <laughs> accent? Uh, um, Yes, actually, my friend is. And she's always teasing. I'm always teasing her because she says a girl. She says a girl. Girl. And she has a sweet little er. Uh, to her <laughs> anyway I'll, I'll consult with her but just so you know i'll say it here yes yes i mean awesome. I, I i'm such a fan of both of you i will just go and show up and give you bring you your coffee that's what i would do yeah it would be a pa um no really though uh you're right guillermo it is it's really fun really fun and exciting when you you get a director that cares and i've had that in moments of my life and then god's not dead or like a really good producer yeah, a really good producer. <laughs> Winky, I love you, Bob. Um, but Harold Kronk was our our director, and he let us just be. And I've talked about this on, on camera. I had one major scene in that movie, and it was a long scene. And it was actually, literally, it was like God had written it for me. It was my audition scene. I I got this scene and I thought I'm going to finally get to like tell the world all I really feel. And I do this scene at, you know, three o'clock in the morning for God's not dead. And where'd it go? Corey? They cut it down to two sentences. <laughs> oh, wow. 
And I'm telling you, it, I was cry- I'm still obviously a little bit uh, crushed yeah. about it. A little couch moment. <laughs> a little bit, but but I I I know God did it for a reason, and they kept the character humble and pure, as you were saying, yeah. uh, Pedro, for a reason, you know. But it was really hard to accept that, you know, as an actress and as a moment of like. And then I heard God really loud and clear say, oh, stop. <laughs> it's not about you. It's about me, <laughs> right? Because yeah. the, the movie's about about God, not me. Well, I have yes. to tell you that, that we definitely felt uh, the, the need of, of, of help from God because when you decide to make a movie that, <clears throat> look, um, you can make a movie with a million, a million and a half or $2 million, an independent movie, as long as as it happens in the same place with the same people, right? But when you're making a movie that happens 500 years in the past, it becomes a historical piece. And those movies, it's really difficult to make them less than $10 million. So we embarked to watch, to make a movie with a big budget of uh, around $2 million that is historical and real time. That's wow. unheard. Like indie movies don't do that. You know, like honestly, we had a big help. Like I could feel the hand... You know, like a big influence, big help up there, and 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 I'm forever grateful that that we were able to finish the movie with the quality that it has. You know, like it's testament. Uh, to be honest, look, I I am I've won a bunch of awards in in my career, and uh, uh, like a, a few, uh, and uh, uh, but it it really has never changed me. I don't see like there's there's people that think that the award really the accolade or the you know, like the, the vindication gives you everything. To me, it's it's about really uh, the contents I'm putting out there. You know, like my goal really is to redeem human kindness, the well, human condition in a way, so we can be more um, uh, tender to each other. We can be better to each other. So th- there can be a balance. You know, instead of like destroying everything in, in this world that, that that we have, it's beautiful paradise that we have uh, of a world, right? So. Uh, but but there's a testament of the quality of the movie. Like uh, we just won a Remy Award for best directing. The Remy Award, I didn't know this. Yeah. You know, honestly, like uh, I, I didn't know it. it. It's from the Houston International Film Festival, which is a prestigious film festival. It's the third oldest in the nation. But I didn't know that they had the Remy Award. I never heard of it. And uh, it's this award that won uh, Lucas Spielberg, the coin for others, uh, Ridley Scott, like really really important people. It was like their first big award, you know? and we just won that for for best directing. That tremendously humble, obviously. That's cool. I, that I is cool. I wouldn't be like I wouldn't be able to have done that achievement without Guillermo, and without so many people that made it happen. All all these people that were behind me doing this this movie and that believed this in, in this idea of creating something that was really pure and honest and humble because it it really is a portrait of a humble, pure and honest native man and how that parallel, nothing has changed and it's still happening today, modern day, just like it used to happen in the era of the conquistadors in Mexico. Wow. I mean, you just said it, you know, we're all divided right now. And to do projects that mean something, I can tell by both of you, you both care and are sincere about your work and what you do and how you're trying to reach people, right? And and I always say this, if we could just reach one person, then our job is, you know, if we're not about God's business, we have no business. And you guys have certainly done that. And I'm grateful. It's a beautiful project. It's beautifully shot, beautifully done, beautifully edited. It's, I highly recommend, Lady of Guadalupe. Um, we do have three questions for each of you, for both of you. Sorry. So... If that's okay, we can transition into this. All right. Um, uh, I always say this wrong. I'm dyslexic. So as an actor, you can imagine how <laughs> it's like Corey, Guillermo's laughing, right? Corey's going to try to ask you a question that she's gotten wrong on I almost wrong every, every episode. Time. And it is a question that Corey came up with. <laughs> well, here's the thing. God giveth and God taketh away. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I know. Uh, so for both of you, we'll start with Pedro first because you're up top here um, and you're right by underneath the sign. Uh, three words that describe yourself. Um, I, I mean, I don't usually define myself because I find it a little arrogant, but I, 
because it's a it's a show i will tell you that i think that three things people can say a lot of things about me but uh three things that i think either you like me or dislike me you you know like anybody can say is that i'm honest you know some people might like that or not but i'm really honest always and um i am i am uh persistent you know like i i have a drive that i will continue to go and 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 i believe in consistency and the quality of of my work and in my behavior with other people that's why mm. principles and integrity and and caring for the others is so important to me this is why i write the stories that i write and this is how why i direct the way i direct and i care for my stars and my actors the way i do it you know like every body counts everybody's important big or little i listen to everybody you know and um that's that's me that's like i, I think, love that well, that's, yeah. a, that's how it should be and that's beautiful not every set is like that i want to be on your set pedro um <laughs> you. i do i you know what honestly you know when i first started you you have to treat everyone equal and it doesn't yeah. matter if you are the caterer or if you are you know the grip or if you are know everybody's first name mm -hmm. talk to them include them it's it's about being inclusive we're all god's kids um okay so guillermo three words that describe you? I will tell you playful, uh, creative, and free. Free? Yeah. I love that. That's great. That's I, I, I have a word that he forgot. I have a word uh -uh. that he forgot. Now, besides talented, obviously, yeah. but positive. Guillermo mm -hmm. is a force of positiveness. And wherever he goes, uh, he he impacts the people around him with that positivism. I love that. It's not just That's the typical beautiful. positivism, like oh everything is pretty. No no no. <laughs> he, he, is, he is like how can I say? I he drives that. he drives people on their on positive values. That's beautiful, and that's so 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 necessary right now. Okay, so we're gonna do the Rorschach test. Okay, this is basically the ink blot test. She's gonna hold up an ink blot and an image, and do at the same like, time, no, at the same, same time. time, you tell us first thing you see. Ready? Oh, I cannot see it because it's got, oh, there you go. Um, it uh, looks like a, like a, oh, it's complicated. Uh, it looks kind of like planet Earth, you know, from, from, from a distance. And uh, oh, yeah. it also, I, I would say butterfly. Butterfly. <laughs> To that positive note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one looks like uh, like an angel flying up. You know? Yeah, I would say a raccoon. Oh, there you go. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's no a right or wrong answer, by the way. All right, this one looks like uh, an iron mask. You know, like okay. somebody wow. wearing that, like yeah, Darth Vader. Two eyes. Looks like Darth Vader. Yeah. I see two guys dancing right there. Mm -hmm. Right, two Russian guys oh, yeah. with the hands, right, yeah. See, I see two elephants, and sometimes I'll, I yeah. see like two bears if it's this way. It's interesting yeah. how our mind really works, right? Everybody yeah. sees. Yeah. Oh. I don't like this one, by the way. Oh, wow. That that looks like a sacrum, like the bone where, like the hip, you know? It really looks like uh, like the hips and the pelvis. Yeah. 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 You think? Yeah, I think it, it is. It, it, Without legs, though. <laughs> Somebody took the legs off. <laughs> Did you say it, Guillermo? Sorry. Uh, I'll say Batman. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I think it looks like a chicken carcass once you've eaten all the chicken off. Like That's you know. why they call it a carcass. Oh, sorry. Oh, that definitely looks like, uh, like, uh, like a, a clown crying. Crying clown. Yeah. Well, uh, definitely. It looks like a wolf. Like a wolf. Yeah. With yeah. Something yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Jason Batman and a butterfly. This is not my favorite game, but we're phasing that oh, out, so Bob. So I know negative. I'm not. I'm not really negative. You need to be positive, like Guillermo. I Guillermo is very to, positive. I need to talk to you, Guillermo. <laughs> get, get some positive things, Bob, please. Yes. <laughs> um, our, my last question is, and don't feel obligated, even though I'm not even in the same league as you two, because you two are really incredible. Um, who is your oop your celebrity crush? Rolling your eyes. Yeah, I'm going like um, this, going, oh, not you, me. You're going to learn to blink them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'll let Guillermo go first. 
It's a tough one. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I have many. <laughs> um, Who's the most recent? I, I mean, yeah, you can default if you want. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, okay, so let me let me tell you one. I I I, I always wanted to meet J Lo because I, th I, I there's something about her. I think that, you know, I'm always mesmerized by her energy and, and you know, and and the passion that, that she has, you know. Um, Can I tell you a little fun fact about her? Yeah. J-Lo, if you're listening. I actually did her makeup on a show called, I used to do hair and makeup, and I did her makeup on a show called Home and Family Show and oh, just wow. touched her up. It wasn't that big of a deal. She had just finished Selena, and she is exactly what you said. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I mean that, that's you know it's incredible. I mean, she, and she's now fifty something, and she yeah. she looks like twenty something. Is yes, unbelievable. She's amazing. Yeah. Okay, Pedro. Uh, well, I, I have a. I, I see it as act like obviously celebrities, actors, people that I, that I like, and I would love to direct them too. So I have two. I have a, a man and a woman. I want to be like like democratic between the genders. Yes. Um, I think that. As a female, I, an actress that I, like blows me away with her capacity is Kate Blanchett. You know, yeah. yeah. Kate Blanchett is like now. Now, obviously, she's coming. Uh, she's just maturing as, as an actress, and, and, and playing all roles are more uh, age uh, for for her age. But but the truth is that I follow her career since I was a kid, and he is like sorry, now. Yeah. yeah she uh, other other actors that, that I'm crazy about obviously uh that i would love to direct because every time that i see them I, I believe them that they are the role that they're playing it doesn't matter how many times one is uh benicio del toro benicio del toro is agreed it's a dream that one day we, we could work with him you know and uh and the other one is denzel washington definitely you know maybe maybe who knows if i will get lucky enough to like uh work with them because you know life is like that but but uh but uh, you know, uh, another of, of my favorite actors is obviously Guillermo Iván. I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't make a difference between them and the big ones. But I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, like just like, uh, like you know, like one day you see somebody and they're like so humble, and and suddenly they become mega, mega stars. I, I see that path for Guillermo. He has, you know, when it comes uh, down to like Denzel totally Washington, they I, send I him scripts. It. You never know; they all do independent films. Bruce Willis just did two really low budget independent films over the last year or so. You never know. They, could, they can always say yes. You know, one of the things that out of this whole conversation today is speak it as though it is so. When you were young, that happened to you with the Pope. And when you were with your parents at six years old and you're watching The Awakening, you said it. You spoke it into existence, right? And my, I constantly remind my daughter of that. Like, you know, our tongue is, the, in the Bible, it says is a rudder that guides our ship. And we have the ability to connect negatively, right, or positively, and when you speak it over your life, I, I can't tell you how many times I've spoken something and it actually happens. We just started the show three and a half months ago. Three and a half months ago, and we have thirty four four episodes. And so it's it's really just an idea and speaking it and then putting it into this motion and then God does the rest, right? Um, I can't thank you guys enough for being here today. I I realize we've taken you over your hour. I apologize, but you're both incredible. That was time and a half. And yeah, you're both incredible, and I'm I'm a fan, and and I wish you nothing but the best. And I hope whoever's listening watches this movie, Lady of Guadalupe. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful story. It's beautifully shot. It has incredible talent, such as yourself, Guillermo, and Pedro. And I can't thank you enough for being the perfect example. Honestly, uh, that Hollywood isn't what people necessarily that negative connotation it's you guys it's people that are making a well, difference Hollywood should be those guys well it is right. though it is and it's people that are making a difference and really putting great projects out there so thank you we love you and we just pray that all your heart's desires come true so thank, thank you thank you so much I, I thank really, you. really appreciate it uh, if you saw the trailer and make you cry I would recommend for you to uh, watch the movie on the Saturday or Sunday because there's going to be more of that. <laughs> and uh, and thank you for having us here. It, it, it is difficult to like try to put positive values and, and things out there, you know, uh, but we are putting our, our two cents, our little grain of sand in yeah. there. We will continue doing that.
Thank you. And I just want to say that, you know, you guys are doing the same thing. I mean, you're, you're putting the positive energy out there and you're doing creative stuff. And, and, you know, we're also your fans. So thank you for thank doing you. what you, what you guys are doing. Thank you. Well, th I had help. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Big and kiss. we're out. Hi, guys. I'm Corey Oliver, and thank you for watching The Coriolis Effect. We hope you enjoyed the previous episode. Here are some more episodes you might enjoy. Hit the subscribe button below, and have a great day.